54, everybody, heavenly sunlight. Okay, Brother Sadler, I'm going to let you lead us in prayer. <laughs> Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity of being back in this place to worship this evening. Father, we thank you that when the storm is raging outside, that we have sunshine in our soul because we know the light of the world. Father, we thank you yeah. for this day of worship, a day of rest. Bless us now in our fellowship together this evening as we worship. Be with Brother Blaine as he shares your message with us. Yes. May you continue to lift up those on the prayer list who have special needs. Bless those who have lost loved ones, those whose lives are being threatened by illness. Father, we commit this service to you now. Lead us by your spirit, for we yes. pray in Christ's name. Yes. Amen. Amen. Okay, just look over on the next page, 425. He keeps me singing. Somebody stop that lady. She's She's making me tired. <laughs> you borrow my stuff. They hollered over here this morning and didn't holler back. The preacher should have had that back for you. <laughs> Hang on, I got something for you to sing. <laughs> <laughs>
baby. Mm, baby. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Has it been?
since you knew that he rents for you and would keep you the long night through. How long has it been since you woke with the dawn and fell that the day is worth living? Can you call him your friend? How long has it been since you knew that he cared for you? I am so glad y'all are here tonight. I seen that weather. I said, well, it might just be me preaching to Ellis tonight. I don't know. Brother Jerry showed up. I says, I know we're going to have us a good crowd now. I have actually preached in churches way smaller, way, 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 way smaller, and uh, big buildings that are empty. That's one of the saddest things you've ever seen when you see a big building church and you, it's very empty. And that's one of the things that's taking place in our world today. As you see, the, the church is dying. And I, one of the reasons is it's because of the, really, it's, it's lack of Bible study. And what I mean by that, you know, religion has become the operative. One of the first things my daddy had taught me as a kid, he says, religion sends you to hell. And when I was young, it was understanding the concept. So you can go through all the rituals, you can go through all these different things. But the relationship is what changes the whole perspective. When you have that relationship with Christ, going to church is not the ritual. It's not something just because my poppy went there or something like that. Uh, I hope no matter where you ever live at, you know, you might have grew up here and this might be your, your family church. It may not. But here's a question. If you weren't here, would you go to church? And one of the saddest things is you see people move away from their home areas as they quit going to worship. Because, see, they never had a spiritual transformation that took place in their lives. So when they look at a church, it's just another structure. And you can go through and have a, a habit of, of, of doing the sign of the cross every time you uh, pass a church. But that doesn't mean you have a transformation that's taking place in your heart. I want to look with you, if you would. We're going to take just a moment tonight. And I want to look at, what's well, not ten minutes after. Y'all could have sang a half hour more. <laughs> We're going to have to get more than three songs now with that. But uh, Acts chapter 5, let's look at verses uh, 19 through 32. 19 through 32. If you can stand with me tonight, if you're able to physically, I know this weather has some of your knees hurting and your back's hurting and all that kind of stuff. Let's so get them popping out here. Acts chapter 5, verse 19 through 32. It says, But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison, and taking them out, he said... Go, stand, and speak to the people in the temple the whole message of this life. Upon hearing this, they entered into the temple about daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest and his associate came, they called the council together, even all the synod of the sons of Israel, and sent orders to the, prison's house, to the prison house for them to be brought. But the officers who came did not find them in the prison, and they returned and reported back saying, we found the prison house locked quite securely and the guards standing at the doors, but when we had opened up, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them as to what would come of this. But someone came and reported to them, the men whom you put in the prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went along with the officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence, for they were afraid of the people that they might be stoned. And when they had brought them, they stood them before the council. The high priest questioned them, and saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. 
The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Something's jumping, huh? It won't go into 32? I'll read it right here. That's okay. Chapter 5, verse 32. I got it. It's locked up. That's okay. It mine's not locked up. It's still opened up. And we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Let's use that as our word tonight. Father, we thank you, God, for your holy presence. We thank you, God, that the word is always the word and never changes. Father, as we open our hearts tonight, we seek your face, asking, Lord, that you would speak to us. Search us, Father. For, Father, we want to be right with you. Lord, bless this group tonight. I pray, Father, that you would touch them in a mighty way and touch our community and touch this world. But, Father, they need Jesus Christ. We need Jesus Christ. So, Lord, may you be glorified in everything said and done. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. You may be seated. So I just want to talk to you a little bit about the gift of repentance, just the gift of repentance. I don't know if you ever thought about it this way. When you look at the Scripture, we, we understand that God is the, the greatest giver. Because when you go back to John 3, 16, and we see where Jesus Christ was given of a, as a gift. He shed his blood on Calvary so that we might have repentance, forgiveness for all our sins. And when you understand that eternal life is the greatest gift that you can ever receive, eternal life goes on and on and on. And it's, it's, we can't even fathom it and it's extended, but it's a free gift of God to those who have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But all God's gifts, when you understand that everything he gives is perfect, everything is, is something that's a, a benefit to our lives. Now what this, the text is talking about tonight, when you read these particular scriptures here, and that goes from verses 19 all the way through 32, it speaks of repentance as a gift of God. And when you start understanding that, I mean, perhaps you've never considered it as such. I mean, I don't know if you ever thought about it. Because, you know, the word uh, repentance in Hebrew means to turn away from. And you understand that we have this perfect opportunity we have the only opportunity to receive Christ is to turn away from our sins and receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So when you look at this you, and you say, okay, so what's the gift of repentance? You've got to understand what it's not. Because one of the things we have to do is look at it. See, because a lot of people go through what they think repentance is. It's not just some kind of emotional crisis of remorse or shame because I've been caught with my hand in the cookie jar, so to speak. It's not because I've been caught in the act or something like this. It, it's not just because I have a, a deep conviction of sin in my life. It's, it's not doing penance and seeking that I'm going to balance out the books if I, if I do this and, and I get all these things straight or I beat myself, you know, in some some countries they literally beat themselves and they they think that that's going to get things right it's not restitution for damage that i've done to somebody and and i'm just trying to get those books corrected and everything it's not praying earnestly and just making good resolutions that lord i'm going to live better in the future and i'm going to get those things it's not breaking just a bad habit like i'm i'm gonna quit this and i'm never going to do it again repentance means to change your mind you see, at one time in your life, you were looking at sin in a different perspective than what you do now. Now, you might have made a decision for Christ early in your, early in your life. You, maybe you have, and I don't know. But somewhere in your life, you had to look and change your mind on what per, the perception of sin really is. You had to look at sin and say, I don't want to go in that direction anymore. You had to look at sin and understand it differently. So basically, what you were doing was throwing your car into reverse all of a sudden in life. And it was hard when you think about it, when you're going down the road 50 miles an hour and you shove your, your truck or your car in reverse, it is a traumatic happening that takes place. Matter of fact, everybody around there notices because all of a sudden you see things taking on your truck or car, you'll see the transmission laying on the highway and stuff. And it's such a change, it's such a traumatic change that people notice it and see that you're changing your direction. Repentance is getting life in line with, with God's ways and His purposes. See, because before, it's always about the selfishness of going and doing what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it. 
you wouldn't even be here tonight with all those threats of weather and no one would ever say anything or even think uh, uh, anything about it. But because your life has been changed, you see coming to church and worship in a different perspective than before. And you said, you know, I want to get, I want to go up there and I just want to praise the name of Jesus Christ. When you start getting a change and you start seeing, I, I'm, I'm not going after just to please Blaine anymore. I'm not going after what just makes me happy anymore. I want to glorify Jesus Christ with everything I say, everything I do, and my actions. I want people to see Christ in me. See, when you start getting your life in line with God, there's a result that people notice. It involves a, this radical change of, of the mind about God. As a child, I thought as a child, and I looked at things from the perspective that, that I perceived it at that moment, and I didn't see God the way I see him now. I see that God loves me so much that he gave his only begotten son. I see that he's willing to forgive me. I see that he's not turning away from me. I see he pursued me when I pursued everything else. He's always been there for me. So in, instead of rebelling, you start to understand his love through the gospel. And that's one thing when I used to go, because I was always in church, my family always had me in church, and I was always sitting in the pews. But that didn't change me until I received that message of Christ, and I repented. It changed my whole perspective of the messages that that old preacher was saying years ago. I used to hate to see them preachers crying and, and weeping up on there, and I could actually give you some names of preachers that even been through this area and stuff. And at that time, I says, oh, man, why are they doing that? And I find myself heartbroken over the conditions of the world today, and I find tears going down my face because there's been a change in my mindset of how I look at things. When I see the little kids out there and they're going around everywhere except to, to hear the, the message of Christ, I don't look at his numbers on the board. I look at his souls that's not growing in the Word of God. And we're not growing in the Word of God. We don't have the armor to face the situations that are daily going to be right before your face. And without that, you become weakened. And you become fragile. See, when I was younger... I rebelled against everything that I had learned. I rebelled against hearing the message of Christ. I rebelled against hearing the word of God. I rebelled about going to church. I rebelled about tithing. I rebelled about what God called love. I rebelled about receiving it. You see, but when I responded to it and repented and I turned my life over to God, all of a sudden that message, that gospel message of Jesus Christ penetrated me and I saw it from the perspective of someone giving their all for someone like me. It changed how I looked at the altar calls because I didn't look at it as for somebody else. I looked at it as something for me. And I responded to it in faith and received Christ and I, I let him love me. See, repentance is so much different than what we think we understand. Because repentance involves this radical change of the mindset about sin and itself. Because when you see sin differently, sin <laughs> becomes dark and dirty and nasty when it used to be a joke. When I, when I started understanding that sin is being contrary to the will of God in my life and to this world, and when you start, when you repent, what you do is you, you recognize that destructive nature of sin. It used to just be the, 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 the drinking or this or the, these certain actions. And I said, you know, that this was something that was fun. I, I couldn't see how it hurt anybody. I couldn't see how it was damaging anybody else. But when you recognize how destructive sin is in your life, and the people who surround you, you start to, to despise it rather than to adore it. But before you have that radical change in your life, you pursue it like a hound after a deer. And you chase it and chase it and chase it. And the whole time, God's trying to call you off that track and put you on the right track. The whole time, he's trying to call you into a rescue to deliver you. You know, I used to love to hear that old, uh, that old deacon that used to be around here. What's, what's that guy you sell him, um, tell all them old stories about coon hunting and all that? What's his name? Jerry Clower. I knew I was your cousin. I know that. 
<laughs> when I was up here, first time I talked to Brother Marcel, uh, and I heard his name, Marcel. You don't hear that's not a common name to hear. First thing, I, and I knew Jerry Clowers from up here. <laughs> I tell, uh, I asked Marcel, uh, brother, brother Marcel, I says, uh, uh, are you the one that Jerry Clowers talking about <laughs> up in them stories? And you know, he'd pull my leg for a little bit, tell me he was there for a little bit. So I got to watch. But you know that story he talks about when they're out there coon hunting? And they, they had a, a wild cat up in that tree. And how that guy was up in there. And he goes up there and they used to, you'd poke him old coons out so the hounds would catch him, right? And I, I have an Uncle John. He's, he, he's, he's a wild man. And I always thought about my Uncle John. But you know, as I think about that story, a lot of times it's like us. We get in there and we're pursuing something and we poke at it with a stick until it turns around and bites us. And we say, oh, somebody got to give me some relief. Somebody's got to help me up here. And the only one who can help you is God Almighty. And you see, we get a hold of these wildcats. We get a hold of the sin in our lives and we think we wanted it until we get a hold of it. And it starts damaging us. Repentance, it, 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 it's, it's this radical change of my perspective. And you start seeing them, uh, the, the people around you, as God's creation. You start seeing people from the perspective of not as enemies or friends. You start seeing them from being someone that God created, that he gave them. He knows every cell in their, bo their body. He knows every spot upon them. He knows everything about them, and he loves them. You know what would happen into our churches today if we really understood that? If we really were in our Bible studies and we started understanding what it means to see somebody as someone created by God Almighty, a child of the King, we wouldn't talk to them the way we do. We wouldn't handle them the way we do. We would hold them in high esteem as something precious because they're a child of the king. See, when you start having that repentance in your life and you start seeing things from a different perspective, it changes everything. It changes how you speak, how you walk, and how you talk. Repentance involves that change of mind about what really matters in life in the first place. Because when you're, you ever notice when you're young, you think you're indestructible? Any of you ever thought you were indestructible when y'all were younger? And you drove like a bunch of hoodlums? Ellis had to chase you up and down the roads. He's told me all, oh, you bunch of hoodlums, pull y'all over him. Y'all fortunate that he liked y'all, wouldn't give y'all tickets. He should have given you tickets. I don't hear nobody amen in that, Charlie. There's something wrong here. Look, life should be lived for the glory of God. Do you understand? We have it messed up because we watch so much of the soap operas and the operas. We watch so much junk that said it's about me, it's about my children, it's about my relatives, it's about our stuff. And what happens when you live that way, you hold it close to you because you want to pass it on to the next generation. When here's the thing, it's not getting passed on to the next generation. God Almighty. Ain't nobody amen in that either, Brother Mike. I might all start this over again. Y'all might start this over again. You see, when I live my life for the glory of God, it's not about my comfort, it's not about my ease, it's not about my peace. And we, we get pastors to come in, and what everybody wants a pastor to do is what? And since this is just cousins, Brother Sadler will say it. Marry us, and what? And bury us. Well, you know, he does a pretty good funeral service. We might keep that rascal around. Don't you go nowhere to after we're buried now. And see, that's a, that's a good thing. I'm not penalizing or, or trying to be so skeptical on that. I understand that perception. But here is the thing. Everybody's life should be lived for the glory of God and for the good of others. So that they might see Christ and rather, it's, it, then rather me just in self-indulgence and passing stuff down to my children, the one thing I pray that my children know is that they're a child of the king and they should serve the master. You know, it's so easy getting so involved with, because we got more things that we can do than ever before. I always get a kick because like Brother Robert, 
Bateman back there. How many vacations have you been on, Brother Robert? Now look, y'all, watch him. How many vacations have you ever been on in your life? Didn't they send you in the military one time, like for graduation, you got a vacation? <laughs> they sent you a little love letter, or, you, or did you volunteer? Did you, you, you went in the military a little while, didn't you? That was a vacation, wasn't it? <laughs> he went all the way to Iceland. Everybody's begging to go to Iceland. Everybody's seen that pay package right there, right? It's like 20 below zero or more. Listen, he's never went on vacation. You know, a lot of times we live our lives like we're on vacation anymore. And our children have got it, have got it absolutely down pat of what it means to be on permanent vacation. And what happens is when we're on vacation, you know what we hate to do? What don't you like to do when you're on vacation? You don't, because you go on vacation and do what? Get away from work, right? Get away from that routine, right? So if you're always on vacation, you never want to work. You know one of the hardest things about serving the master? He says, pick up your cross and follow me. You know, just the perspective of picking up your cross, just the perspective of following Christ Almighty. Because what did Christ do with his life? There's nothing wrong with vacations, by the way. But let me ask you, if we stay on permanent vacation, who serves the master? The reason a lot of people like going to larger churches, and I understand that concept, is because there's so many people there to do things. The hardest thing to go to a small church is somebody's actually going to expect you to do something. Maybe God Almighty. And it's hard because we wonder, well, why doesn't anybody else pick up? Why doesn't anybody else do it? Well, why doesn't anybody else pick up the cross? You see, we have a special calling because when we repent and we receive Christ, we saw things differently. And you know what we look at then? is how can I do the master's will? Now, does that mean you're going to get a lot of praise down here on earth? No, nah, I ain't going to tell you that. I ain't going to tell you everybody's going to pat you on your back. But I'm going to tell you one day when you stand before Jesus Christ, your, your difference of perspective here is going to make a world of difference right there. Yeah. See, God, God is the creator. He's the author of repentance. And it's a gift from God by his goodness that he's, he's willing to give us that, to forgive us. See, God leads us to repentance. You remember when you received Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, how you were under conviction? And you started thinking different. It's a, it, that's a, it's a basic change of my thinking about God and His will for life. When I gave my life to Him, it changed it. And He came in and He showed you. You remember? You remember when you come under that conviction and you, you said, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Lord, I just ask you to forgive me of my sins. And you repented and you turned from that perspective. But can you imagine if you didn't have that? Can you imagine if you never got to that point where you saw things differently? Where would you be at? You see, that's the difference in a mommy daddy salvation and a Holy Ghost salvation. You see, some would be walking out because mommy and daddy was there. But what if they never made a decision for Christ? What if it was just you? Would you be where you're at today? See, unless you repent and God offered it to you, he says, here it is. I'll forgive you if you just turn away. If you just receive me as your Lord and Savior. See, God uses that life that we possess and he teaches us. And, and when we understand that how he teaches us about the, the life and the teachings of Jesus Christ, and we look at things differently, that's why the world doesn't understand us. Because they don't understand Jesus Christ. They don't understand how anybody would ever come to this world and, from all perfection and come to the world, be rejected, torn, spit upon. But it might be the same reason so many people turn away from repentance. Have you ever seen people come to the church and you know the Holy Spirit was dealing with their heart and they never repented? Have you ever looked at pews? I've been in churches where it looked like cats was climbing the side of the, them pews. Because it had like fingernail marks. See, when, when you look at it from, from up here, there's... The light hits it in such a fashion. You can see where everybody sits at, and you can see worn spots. You can also see 
where they were flexing their fingers during an altar call. And when somebody doesn't do that, they missed out on the greatest gift. To know that no matter what I've done in my life, that God is willing to forgive me. The worst of sinners. Doesn't matter where you've been, where you're from, if you just turn to Jesus Christ. Right. What a gift. What better gift. How many people waller in their shame, in their embarrassment, in their guilt because of their past? How many people never enter, <laughs> never enter into peace because they're still holding on to things that God's saying, I'll give you relief. I'll take that away from you. How many people are still walking a road to destruction and you look at them and say, why? Why are you going in that direction? When I was younger and I had first made a, a truly given my heart to Christ, I kept wondering, well, how come everybody doesn't do it? How come everybody doesn't receive Christ as their Lord and Savior? And it's amazing to me how many people will turn away when they're offered a free gift. When I looked at this, and I start studying about Jesus Christ, and how he changes my world, and how when I placed my, my faith, that it changed the relationship, because I truly understand what it means to be loved. Truly. God has taken my life and changed it in a better way. In Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31, this is what it says. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. You know, when you go back in history and you study this, I, I love history, and you see the recordings of Jesus Christ all the way back in the Roman papers, and you understand that we're here all these thousands of years later, we're still talking about him. The only way. The only way. It, you know, the world says that you're a bigot if you say that there's more... If you say that the only way to, to God is through Jesus Christ. Well, the, the whole thing is, is a lack of understanding because there is no other God who gives you forgiveness. There is no other one. There is no other God who gives you repentance. The opportunity to turn your life around and receive God as your Lord and Savior. It's such a gift. And when you, as you get older and you start understanding what this means... Because have you ever had somebody mad at you in your life? Charlie, you don't even have to say nothing. We already know the answer to that. No, I, I promise you, Charlie, I've had more than you've had. People don't think so, but I promise you I have. Brother Sadler would understand that. As a pastor, you always have someone who is looking at you in a particular way and mad because you were, weren't there or somewhere else or anything like this because you're, what you're trying to do the best you can with what you have. But when you get out there and you understand what forgiveness truly is. Now, when you look back on your life, have you ever seen somebody who never forgave you? Have you ever heard somebody in the church say, I will never forgive you? See, I've heard it. I've heard it. Now, it's scary to me that somebody would be in the house of God, they would say such a thing because of what Scripture says. But it also shows me that people don't understand what this means. You see, when you understand what forgiveness is, you're more than willing to offer forgiveness. Repentance is a gift from God, and, and uh, it's a human response to God. See, God is the giver. Every single person needs to repent. It says that in the scripture. Everybody. Uh, we repent for the glory of God that people might see that glory of God for, so that others can see it for the good of others that they might see the change in your life. When I was saved and, and God changed my life and my whole perspective, it shocked people because I went back and I started to repent to people that I felt I had sinned against. So I went and I actually went back to places where, where I had a position and, 
and uh, you know I, I used to I used to have a lot of employees and stuff and I went back and and I did things from a perspective as a lost person it was what I thought profitable at the time but all that profit was for naught but when I discovered what it meant to be forgiven and I saw people from the perspective as being a creation from God I went back to say I'm sorry to their face I went back and I told them that I'd sinned against them and I'd sinned against God. The great thing is God's willing to forgive me. And when I did that, I prayed that it was for the benefit of Christ Almighty that others might see Christ in me. You see, there's nothing like understanding that you're loved. Repentance is a, is a journey from the, from the mind of the flesh to the mind of the spirit. When you walk in the flesh, you, you do things from the perspective of the flesh. What the flesh says is pleasant. What the flesh said is beneficial. But when you do it from the Spirit, it's what the Holy Spirit says, this is what's best. And it changes, it, it makes you from going to be a selfish individual. And you may not consider yourself selfish. But if we really saw it from the eyes of Christ, I believe you can see in our lives that we truly have a selfish nature about us. Because we always look to see what benefits me and mine, and that's all. When Christ says, do it for his glory. Yes. When you understand repentance, it changes your whole life. If you could bow your heads for just a moment. As they're coming down to play an altar call song tonight. hope with these few words it's just I hope I can get the understanding of repentance across to people because it's nothing like understanding that I'm redeemed there's a song they sing now and it's, it's on the contemporary radio it says I am redeemed and when you start thinking about, I've been set free. When you start thinking about those heavy chains that's been laid aside. And you say, I've been loved. I've been forgiven. And when you give your life to Christ and you start seeing this world from that perspective, it changes your appetite. It changes your appetite to what can I do that others might see Jesus in me and might know his redemption. So tonight as they play that altar call, so these altars are open. Maybe you want to pray for somebody. Maybe you want to pray for yourself. Maybe you want to pray for me. But the greatest thing is that you can pray. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you tonight. Just
just as I am poor wretched blind side rich is he lean of the mind yea Father, we thank you tonight, God, for your holy presence. I thank you for the truth in your word. I pray, Father, that, Lord, you would take the words that I have spoken and anoint it, that the hearts might receive it, and that, Lord, it might give peace and relief and challenge. So, Lord, we give you the praise and glory, for you are God Almighty, Savior of our souls. Be glorified tonight in each family here. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Thank you. 